Well, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Rowan White. Two years ago, Rowan gave an amazing, inspiring talk on a panel on seeds at the NOFA New York Winter Conference, and we all said, we need to hear more from her. And it seems to me that there, for a long time, that there really has needed to be more communication between organic farming people and Native American people. We have so many values in common, and there's so much to learn from one another. In the prayers of the Onondaga, as I experienced when I went on the Turo Wampum canoe trip, they start any important event by thanking all of nature from deep in the soil to the tops of the trees. Everything is interconnected. And intersectionality is a welcome word in our political vocabulary these days. And we can learn about this from the Native Americans. Rowan White, Mohawk seed keeper, is from the Mohawk Nation of Aquasasne, a territory that straddles the borders of the United States and Canada along the banks of the St. Lawrence River. And she's the director of the Sierra Seed Cooperative an innovative organic seed co-op focusing on local seed production and education based in Nevada City, California. She's also a member of the board of the Seed Savers Exchange. As seed keeper, Rowan preserves not only the seeds, but also the traditions and the stories that go with them. She writes, seeds have really influenced my life, so I try and imbue that sense of reverence that sense of spirit, that sense of heart, that sense of hope. Rowan grew up on a normal U.S. processed food diet, she tells us, but had the curiosity to ask the elders what happened to their traditions. She writes, reclaiming our agricultural heritage and our seed heritage really goes hand in hand with the cultural restoration that's happening within the Mohawk community and within many other indigenous and tribal communities. Those two efforts really cannot be separated. Rowan is a leader in the seed movement. She integrates history, decolonization, liberation, growing food, and reclaiming health. Seed as life force that connects. She is a poet and a scientist, able to help us see the practical, fussy work of producing quality seed in the context of the mystery of their interconnections to ancient human history and to our future here on Earth. So it is my great pleasure to introduce her here today. All right, can you see me over this podium? <laughs> I brought my red corn here, it's sitting here where you might not be able to see it, but uh, as Elizabeth said, we do open most important gatherings or events, talks, proceedings with a few words, so I will just hope that we could put our hearts and our minds together, uh, not only for all the people who are in this room, both seen and unseen, um, but also really acknowledging the ancestors of this land the people whose hearts and blood and, and tears and pain and joy have, have fell upon this earth, uh, the ancestors, their living descendants and their future generations. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Again, my name is Rowan White. Uh, my Mohawk name is Ganyat Dahawe, which means she carries the snow. And I was born into a swirling blizzard about 39 years ago, and just to the north of here. And I'm a mother, and I'm an indigenous farmer, and I'm a sacred seed keeper. And this very land that we stand upon was the very sprouting of my love and my uh, connection and my passion to not only the seeds of my ancestors, but to the revitalization of our traditional foodways as Native people. So I feel so grateful to be able to come back to this very place uh, with mentors like Leslie and Nancy is here, people who really nourished my passion uh, for this work uh, and for this pathway. Um, I come here to share a hopeful message for the seeds. 
I have been witnessing not only their life-giving abundance, but their ability to guide us into projects where we can stand on the intersections of our differences and work together to heal, to share, and to nourish, and to uplift each other. Tonight I'm hoping to share just a few stories of these seeds of hope as I know that we stand in this time in 2018 desperately needing to hear um, some uplifting stories. We are on the brink right now of a new and multi-layered chapter of the organic and res uh, food resilience movement where we can see the restoration of these relationships and perhaps envision what I like to call a kin-centric or family-centric or relationship-centric chapter to the food system where reverence and love and passion and heart is at, the connect is at the very heart of our collective decisions to create access to food and seed and to find the true sustainability of this movement begins with our heart connection and begins with restoring those relationships. Wendell Berry, a wise poet, once said, we exploit what we merely value, but we defend what we love, right? And those words have carried me through times of making renewed connection to this work that lays before us. A beloved teacher and mentor of mine uh, once said, he said, this is Martine Prechtel, he said, in some forgotten part of us, there yet towers the roofless ruins of a neatly made tiny earth and timber palace of some unconscious memory in whose thick walls these amazing ancestors have left for us to find a pot of precious seeds, indigenous seeds of still viable knowledge and living vitality, seeds that could re-sprout into view the organic articles of the original treaty that we humans promised long ago to uphold between ourselves and the wild natural world that the first time we began to cultivate the earth, her plants and animals through agriculture and working with the seeds. Mudded into these forgotten ramparts of our indigenous souls, these seeds of how humans are meant to live have been passed down unnoticed like recessive spiritual genes in our souls from grandparent to grandchild for millennia, waiting for each generation to consciously rediscover them, replant them into welcoming ground, and once again cultivate into view a real, livable, viable array of seed cultures worth descending from. Now that's a powerful prayer. If you can switch to the next slide. There's a healing and hopeful trend that's emerging at the edge of the growing indigenous food and seed sovereignty movement, as well as the social justice movement and the food justice movement, which is what we're calling as native peoples the rematriation of seeds. What you can see up here on the screen are seeds that are emerging from, this particular picture came from the Field Museum in Chicago, but there are a number of seeds that have been removed from our communities over the years that are beginning to come back to us. Across Turtle Island, the seeds are coming home to us. Some have been missing from our communities for centuries, carried on long journeys and smoky buckskin pouches upon necks of people who were forced to relocate from the lands of their births and their ancestral grounds. Generations later, these seeds, they're finding their way home. From the vaults of public institutions, seed banks, universities, museums, seed keeper collections, and some laying patiently on dusty pantry shelves of foresighted elders, seeds patiently waiting and dreaming, seeds waiting for loving hands to patiently place them into welcoming soil so that once again they can fulfill their agreements to help feed and nourish the people. Perhaps we're familiar with the word repatriation, which is the returning of cultural property such as funerary objects, sacred objects, back to um, uh, communities of origin. These displaced cultural items are physical artifacts that have been taken from people of origin, usually in the act of theft, whether it be in the context of imperialism, colonialism, or war. The Native, American Graves and, um, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act describes the rights of Native American lineal descendants and tribes 
with respect to the treatment, repatriation of human re remains, and all of these other things, such as sacred objects. The next slide. In the seed movement, we've begun to use the word rematriation as it, as it relates to bringing these seeds home again. In many communities, including my own Mohawk tradition, the responsibility of caring for the seeds and for the earth falls into the bundle of the women. Both men and women farm and plant, but over the generations, it's ultimately within the realm of the women and part of their responsibility. So the word rematriation reflects the rest restoration of the seeds, not only back to their mother communities, but back to the ancestral land and to mo the mother earth herself. The indigenous concept of rematriation refers to the reclaiming of spirituality, of culture, of knowledge, of resources, instead of the more patriarchal associated repatriation. It simply means back to our mother earth, a return to our origins and to life and co-creation rather than the patriarchal dis uh, destruction, colonization. In this movement of rematriation, it's a reclamation of germination of the life-giving force of the divine feminine, which my descendants, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, held the women in great esteem and at equal power. Another definition as written by my mentor and elder Martine, he says, rematriation, this term describes an instance where land, air, water, plants, ideas, and ways of doing things and living are purposely returned to their original natural context, their mother, the great female holy wild. Like the repatriation of prisoners after years of war or millennia of unwilling slavery in service to unconscious civilization, exploited and depleted for their wild vitality, any attempt to rematriate them back to the holy in nature is the beginning of cultural sanity and healing. So what we're seeing across Turtle Island is that we're beginning to put the pieces back together as native peoples and we're beginning to remember that these original agreements that we made millennia ago when our ancestors came into sacred agreements with our plant relatives and said that we would give up a little of our wildness and they would give up a little of their wildness and we would come together in the sacred covenant to care for one another. That's beginning to rehydrate us and to renew us and give us the power it takes to begin to put our food waste back together again. Next slide, please. Over the last few centuries of disruption of our indigenous food systems, many of our traditional varieties have left our community only to, only to be stewarded by non-native farmers or seed keepers. In addition, Many of these traditional seeds have been stored within public or private institutions. As a part of the indigenous seed sovereignty movement, we are recognizing the need for these seeds to come home again, back into a living cultural context. The incredible spectrum of diversity held within the legacy of, of American seeds is a beautiful reflection of the cultural dimension of biodiversity. Corn, beans, squash, are a magnificent result of a thousands of years of co-evolutionary dance between humans and plants. Corn is not simply a food that has fed and nourished billions over the centuries. It is indeed a representation of our indigenous origins, a dynamic reflection of the unique migrations that we have made as native peoples and also our cosmogenealogies. Indigenous corn, indispensably deeply storied sustenance of our ancestors, integral into our own cosmologies and creation stories. The seeds themselves are whole memory palaces, helping us to remember our lineages and the connection that we have to our ancestors, the land, the layers of culinary and ecological knowledge that are encoded within every single seed and every benevolent food, bite of food that they offer. With much reverence and respect, we see the corn as our mother. And from this cultural center, thousands upon thousands of varieties have been cultivated in the hands of patient and curious farmers. Corns that have fed humble villagers and ironically also fueled empires, right? We see corn being grown on every continent except for Antarctica. As a Mohawk woman, we see that corn is our kindred relative and that we're bound in a reciprocal relationship with her. And we are blessed to continue to learn 
and live alongside her. And in many times in my time, just sprouting here at Hampshire College on the farm here, sitting under her benevolent, beautiful corn tassels and, and learning from her, I realized that not only me, but generations of the new people of this, of the native peoples of this land, that as we were growing the corn, that the corn was growing us, right? That it was teaching us and reminding us not to forget who we are and where we come from. In our Mohawk community alone, we have beautiful and diverse corns, over a dozen different varieties of, um, you know, many different corns you can see over here on this beautiful poster that my elder Steve McCumber has made. What I'd like to point out on this particular slide is that uh, the picture uh, that was taken in 1912 and 1915 was a book that I found almost 20 years ago on a, a dusty shelf at the very top, I think maybe the 20th floor of the UMass Library. And it was a, it was a treatise called Iroquois Foods and Food Preparation written by a man named F.W. Waugh around the turn of the century. And in the back of that book, reading all these stories of, that he had gathered at Grand River Mohawk territory uh, many, many years ago, was this plate and it was uh, corns that he had gathered back then, and also there was a, a, a plate of beans and squashes, various foods. And for me, this was an aha moment because this became the scavenger hunt. As I began to ponder on the dusty farmhouse floor at the Hampshire College farmhouse about the revelation that tomatoes came in other colors than just round and red, and that seeds also had story and lineage and connection, I began to ask myself, who were the seeds of my ancestors? And who were the foods that fed us you know, through the times of joy and celebration and also who carried us through our adversities? And I found this book and I found this plate and, um, and, and then I, I began this journey all over uh, New York State, Southern Quebec and, and Ontario and began to put this in front of our elders and ask them if they still had these seeds of our ancestors. And surely enough, these seeds began to come off of these dusty, dusty pantry shelves and began to come in front of me. Uh, and what I like to uh, acknowledge here is that in 2018, we're still carrying all the corns of our ancestors. And this really is the picture of indigenous resilience. So much has happened in the last... So much has happened to us in the last several hundred years, but there were foresighted elders who knew that we were going to need this corn and that was going to remind us of who we were and where we came from. Each one of these corns has a unique, is a unique dimension of our, not only our biological diversity, but our cultural diversity. We need the blue corn in order to give our babies their names in a ceremony. We need the red corn in order to have a proper wedding to feed, you know, to feed our guests and to feed the people. We need the calico corns in order to, to run our children's ceremonies. We need all of these different foods to honor the sacred ceremonial and agricultural calendar that exists. Inside of these seeds that you see here on the screen, these ancestral seeds, they're witnesses to the past. They're the keeper of the plant and human relationships, one that predates the written word, right? And that there were ancestors generations and generations ago that prayed that those of us who are here in this room, whether it be me and my Mohawk ancestors or you and your long lineage of ancestors, that prayed that we might have food to eat today and that those prayers that they made for us in those longhouses and in those places in you know, the places we now call New York and Ontario and Quebec, those prayers still echo inside of those seeds and they give us strength to continue to move forward to create access and healthy access, uh, access to healthy food in our communities. But these seeds, they almost lost us and, they, and, and we almost lost them. In the era of displacement and acculturation, some of these varieties were completely lost in our communities of origin. Some of these seeds remained in the hands of the people, and some of these seeds left. But there are some beautiful stories of mutual trade between native peoples and you know, the settler farmers that came through. And some of these stories that I'm gonna highlight tonight 
paint a different picture and they kind of go against the grain of the stereotypes that we hold in our hearts of the cowboys and Indians and the, the adversarial relationships. What I'd like to highlight tonight is some of the ways in which Native peoples and settlers work together and the way that the descendants of the settlers and the descendants of the Native peoples are still working together today in order to preserve, preserve some integrity of a, of a bioregionally culturally appropriate agriculture for the Northeast as we uh, live in now. Now some of these seeds, they move and they migrate just like people do. You can change the next slide. As a Mohawk woman, it's my understanding that these seeds have been with us since the beginning of time. When I look into this cob of corn that I'm holding here tonight, I am reminded that our creation story never ended. They unfurl every single season into a continuous cycle of creation that ins inspires renewal every single day. In our creation story, Sky Woman fell into the watery abyss, clutching a handful of seeds from the old world into this new world. The sprouting of these ancestral memories was when our foremother, original woman, shuffled her feet upon the earth and sung the seeds and life into being. When original woman's daughter died in childbirth, it was from her grave that her children saw the agricultural plants sprouting. And it was the new dawn of such agreements that we carry in our blood and our bones. And from her body and from her parting words that the foods that were going to grow from her body were going to be the foods that would feed and sustain the people. It was the beans that emerged from her hands. And it was the corn that came from her breasts. And it was the squash that emerged from her umbilical cord. And it was the sunflowers that grew from her legs, the strawberries from her heart, and the tobacco from her mind. Next slide, please. These seeds are an intergenerational gift from grandmother to granddaughter since time immemorial. It's been told by my elders that the seeds are a reflection of the people. When the seeds are weak and struggling, it means that the people are having a hard time and they're struggling. When our seeds are strong, it means our nations are strong and our communities are strong. These sacred and precious seeds carry our story, sprouting alive into a new form to nourish us in many ways. Our beautiful seeds are a deeply connected to lineage and a very specific place of origin. These foods and seeds are our mirror, our reflection. Their life is our life and we are intimately intertwined with their well-being. We are bound in that reciprocal relationship. What birth gifts should I offer my grandchildren? What will help them survive in this teetering world? When I look in my basket, I see what it should be. Corn mother's heart, the sweet heart of the corn. My children must have whole corn, grain in its story, and they will be corn fed like all of their mountain ancestors have been. Now our ancestors, they kept the seeds al alive amidst incredible adversities. Relocation, the burning of the cornfields during the Revolutionary War, the loss of land base, the boarding school era of acculturation that my grandparents and great-grandparents endured. For this, I deeply thank all of the foresighted elders and ancestors for keeping the seeds alive during these credible times of oppression and acculturation. What an act of courage it was for our ancestors to keep these seeds protected and safe in the face of violent transitions, relocations, assimilations. What an act of courage to think creatively and proactively in the face of disease, to look to food, agriculture, and seeds as a vessel for our collective healing and transformation. What an act of courage it is to plant a seed and save it for future generations. You can go to the next one. There is a powerful work of reconciliation when we work cross-culturally to bring these seeds home to their communities of origin. We are working within the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network to assist communities who are working towards the rematriation of their precious seed relatives. <clears throat> we are working, we are working cross-culturally with many stakeholders, including native farmers, both alive and ancestors, um, 
and representative from tribal communities, institutions, and organizations who have seed collections and who can help facilitate and lay out the needed framework to assist these seeds in finding their way home. I'm thankful to have met so many Indigenous farmers and gardeners who are joining the seed revolution. You can switch the slide. So these seeds right here are two bags of corn that we recently uh, rematriated from the Seed Savers Exchange Seed Bank in Decora, Iowa, one of which had been lost in our Haudenosha Haudenosaunee communities, which is called the Iroquois Tooth Corn. Now I'm helping um, in a larger effort with the Seed Savers Exchange and the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network to rematriate 25 more varieties from Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Potawatomi, uh, Kickapoo, Taos Pueblo, um, Mohawk, and many different Haudenosaunee communities home. We're thankful for the way in which these resilient seeds have uh, traveled so far in so many ways and are returning now home to our people. Next slide. These seeds, this season, we're helping and assisting with the rematri rematriation of seeds from the University of Michigan back to Anishinaabe and Potawatomi communities in the Michigan region. This year, they have initiated a native seed garden where natives are working in collaboration with many people of diverse backgrounds at the university to grow out seeds that have been collected as a part of their botanical collection that have historical roots with natives in that region. It has been an incredible heartfelt project to, to witness and to be a part of. Now this is a project that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, for those of you who've spent any time in the Hudson River Valley, uh, there's a beautiful movie out now that's called Seeds of Hope, which was done by a man named John Bowermaster, which was part of the Hope on the Hudson series, so I'm hoping you guys can check that out. Um, we have Mohawk farmers um, working in collaboration with a Seed Shed and the Hudson Valley Farm uh, Seed Library. We also are working in collaboration with the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, as well as migrant farm workers and inner city youth to come together. And about three, almost four years ago now, uh, a, a group of us Haudenosaunee and Iroquois farmers were gathered at the Central Fire in Onondaga, which is just outside of Syracuse, New York. And we were gathering to put our hearts and our minds together to see what it would take for us to keep the seeds alive for our people. And we were putting down prayer and ceremony and uh, swapping seeds and trading seeds. And when I left there, I went to the farm of Ken Green of the Hudson Valley Seed Library and Seed Company. And I stayed there for two nights and there was a box of seeds that I had on my, bed stand, my bedside stand. And there were these two bean varieties, ancestral bean varieties of our people. And they were asking me, they kept saying, we want to stay here. And I'm holding one of them in my hand. It's, a, it's an Iroquois brown bean. And so those varieties were um, asking to, to, to stay in this place. And so I gave them and I entrusted them to Ken and I said, I just want you to plant them here. These beans want to stay here. And not a week later, the Hudson Valley Farm Hub uh, had called Ken and said, we really want to do a project that honors the native peoples of this land and honors you know, the traditions of these people. And I said, it was those beans. They were, they were working. They, were, they had the magic beans that had a plan. And so it was kind of late in the season. It was late June. Uh, we pulled together about six pounds of our Mohawk red bread corn, a corn that had dwindled down to just one cob in the hand of an elder about 20 years ago. And we began to put our hearts and our minds together with you know, many people from the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, uh, like I said, inner city youth coming together. And we uh, planted a garden and we had hope in our hearts. We decided that we were gonna lay aside our differences. We were gonna work together and leverage what, whatever it was that we had, whether it was resources and money and prayers and seeds and all of these various things, and we were gonna work together with good hearts and good minds. And we planted that garden, and about a year, you know, maybe six or eight months later, we had 2,000 pounds of corn and beans and squash uh, that, ca that came from this one cob of, of red corn. And, that, and those seeds ended up getting loaded onto a big van and, and, and moving their way up to Akwesasne and began to feed uh, the, the youth who were going through the rites of passage and also the um, ceremonies that happen at the longhouse. So that's a really beautiful uh, story of hope and reconciliation and healing. Next slide. This is a beautiful elder that I've had the honor and pleasure of knowing. This woman is named Debeko Hawk. Uh, she is a Pawnee seed keeper. 
They are also working to bring their ancestral seeds not only home to their communities, but back to ancestral soil, working hand in hand with settler descendants in a grand act of reconciliation to keep the food and seeds alive in their ancestral homelands of Kearney, Nebraska. When the Pawnee Nation was forced from its homeland in Nebraska to a reservation in Oklahoma in the 1870s, they lost a lot more than their, than their home and their lives. Deb Echohawk of the Pawnee, who's a sacred seed keeper, <clears throat> she says, there were 12,000 people, and once they got to Oklahoma, the count was 684. Whole families and keepers perished as there was no, nobody there to, to take care of these bundles. And in many of these sacred bundles were these seeds, these precious seeds that you see Deb holding in her hand. So much of the seed was lost. The seed that made it to Oklahoma, as we all know, um, you know, seeds are very regionally adapted when we talk about land race varieties. They're, they're, you know, they're bred to a very particular place. And when they landed in Oklahoma, those seeds didn't thrive. They didn't want to grow. It got to the point where the seed supply had dwindled so low that the precious seeds were stored away and no longer planted or used in ceremony for fear of losing them. But since that time, the tribe's seed supply has gone from a few handfuls and thousands upon thousands of seeds and plots of corn growing in Nebraska as part of the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project. The Pawnee corn first made its way back to Nebraska in 2003 via Ronnie O'Brien, who was serving at the time as a director of the Archway, um, the Great Platte River Road Archway in Kearney, Nebraska. O'Brien had been approached many times by the, by the Pawnee people, uh, saying that the archway's interpretive story and in gardens and museum didn't reflect the native peoples of that land. It told the story of the settlers, it told the story of the covered wagons, it told all of these other stories, but it wasn't representative of the original stories of that land. And so something was missing. And so the partnership and eventual friendship led to the creation between, so, Ronnie O'Brien approached Deb Echohawk and said, is there anything that we can do to support your people and to represent your people in these gardens that we have planted here? And Deb Echohawk took these sacred bundles of seed that her people had been storing away for just the right time. And a grand act of reconciliation and, and redemption gave these bundles portions of these bundles of seed over to Ronnie O'Brien, who was a descendant of the settlers, right? Who had relocated the Pawnee people down to Oklahoma. And a long lasting part of their friendship was when Ronnie O'Brien planted these seeds and invited the Pawnee up and they prayed for those seeds and those seeds flourished and they sprouted there in their ancestral homelands. They started this project in order so that the seeds could remember their ancestral lands. As the relationship between uh, Deb Echohawk and Ronnie O'Brien grew, they began to cultivate more and more of these, uh, of these seeds. And ultimately, the conclusion was that if we don't trust someone, that someone being Ronnie and those descendants of the settlers, we might lose it all as Pawnee people. Next slide. The tribe entrusted O'Brien with one of their most prized varieties, which is the Pawnee eagle corn, named for the spots on the white kernels that look like eagles in flight. This variety is believed to date back to around 1200 when the Pawnees traveled towards Nebraska from Central America. In 2003, the eagle corn was on the brink of extinction with only 50 kernels left on the earth. There were only a handful, quite literally. O'Brien uh, Ronnie planted the last uh, 25 seeds and enlisted the help of a horticulturalist. The seeds took hold and thrived in their native soil and their climate. And since those early days, those original 25 seeds multiplied into 2,000 seeds. And every year now, the Kearney, Nebraska hosts a Welcome Home Pawnee Days, where the descendants of the settlers have been growing fields and fields of these seeds and food, and welcome the Pawnee home, and load up their trucks and their cars, and send them home with these ancestral seeds. And that's something really powerful, right? So in that, if you saw the, the, the bundle of seeds that Deb Echohawk was holding, the Pawnee hold nine sacred varieties of corn. And in their relocation, they lost one of their sacred varieties, which was a speckled red corn. They lost it. it the seeds 
no longer wanted to grow. They were, had been in storage for much too long. Now, when this project began to take root uh, at the archway and then other people started to see the power, I mean, the emotion, the spirit that was involved in these projects, many other people in the small town of Kearney, Nebraska began to offer up their farms and their gardens and their plots of land. And so soon there were many, many more places that the Pawnee could grow their seed in their ancestral homeland. And when they began to grow the red corn out in, in larger patches than just 50 or 100 plants or 150 plants, when they began to multiply those seeds so they could be grown in one acre, two acre, five acres, 10 acres, then I tell you what happened. That speckled red corn, it came back to the people. It came out of that field of red corn. And it was just waiting for that right time and that right moment for the people to come together and listen to the guidance of the seeds and the ancestors and the prayers that were held inside those seeds that now is the time that we need to lay aside our differences, right? We all know the history. And as Native peoples, we'll never forget the history. We'll never forget the, you know, the adversities and the challenges that our people have gone through. But the time that our ancestors is telling us is now is the time for us to work together, right? And to sit under these corn and beans and squash and three sisters and look at each other in the eye and say that we all have something to offer in this movement, right? And that we can find that way, we can find our way through this. Because as we all know, we have much greater um, you know, challenges ahead of us and we have a lot of adversarial uh, people in the world who in their grief of disconnection, in their, and let me say that again, there are people on this planet that are acting in their grief of disconnection, right? That they don't understand who they are and where they come from. And they don't remember that they have original agreements that run through their blood and their bones. That, be, that every bite that they take is because of the benevolence of these seeds and that we all have connection and relationship to these foods. When I was leaving the central fire a few years ago and driving across the great heartland of America. I was uh, traveling through, it was springtime, so it was the time, that new time when all of the corn is just sprouting, you know. And you are all are farmers and you're nodding your head because you know that feeling, that, that feeling, that inhale, that, that sacred inhale when you see something sprouting. And we were driving through Kansas, my kids and I, they were in the back, and we came through this valley and there were all these tiny little corn sprouts growing in these valleys. And I remember being so moved and so um, you know, taken aback by the beauty of it, by my heart, until I remembered that, oh, these were GMO fields. You know, these were those, you know, you know, those glyphosate sprayed fields full of you know, pioneer seeds and asgrow seeds. But my heart reminded me that those seeds were still corn mother, right? They were still corn mother trying to do what she needed to do to feed the people. And I remember the kids and I, we sang our sacred seed songs to those corns. And I had echoing in my head those words of my elders that I spoke about before, which was that the seeds are a reflection of the people, right? That when the seeds are weak, the people are weak. When the seeds are strong, the people are strong. And I took a look at this corn that was all around me, and I began to think that these cornfields, these genetically mod you know, modified cornfields, were a reflection of the American people, right? Broken-hearted people planting broken-hearted seeds and not understanding who they are and where they come from. You know, that's a powerful thing to reflect. It's a powerful thing to reflect as we, as organic farmers and seed keepers and growers, endeavor to move beyond the syndrome of genetic modification. And we move to endeavor to move beyond this time of disconnection and grief that is so inherently embodied in the industrial food system, right? That we have another way through this. And it's a long game approach, people. It's not something that's a quick fix. But what it is, is it's coming together with people of like mind and good heart. And it's endeavoring to teach and raise a new generation of people who love the seeds as though they are their relatives, right? And to approach this work from a place of relationship and a place of connection, right? That's why we need each and every one of you at the table. And that's why we need Native folks, and we need Black folk, and we need Latino folk, and we need you all who all descend from long lineage, 
lineages of indigenous peoples too. We all need to show up at the table and figure out what it is that we're going to do to raise that next generation of reverent, loving, beautiful seed culture that we all know is possible, right? Because we're not going to think our way out of this. We aren't. We're going to have to find a heart way through it. And so, you know, that's one thing that if we can leave tonight holding anything in our hearts from our time here together is to remember that each and every one of us holds that cellular memory and those original agreements in our blood and our bones. That each one of you descend from people who have cosmogenealogies and creation stories and relationship and connection to their food, just like we as Native peoples do. And I dream of that time when we can all sit together and, and share those stories and share that connection and, you know, compost these past failures of this industrial food system. And from that compost, may that sprout these really beautiful seeds of hope that will nourish, uh, you know, many of us in the time beyond our life. Uh, next slide, please. In the kernels of these red corn that we harvested from our beautiful rematriation and reconciliation garden, there's a seed song and there's a story. This is a story of healing through many generations. This is a great, great granddaughter who's allowed to speak her language. This is a story of a mother who sings the sacred seed songs of the corn to her children. This is a story of children being proud of who they are and where they come from. This is the story and song of my great, great grandmother's dreams and wishes coming to life. In the beat of the water drum and in the seeds of the rattle, these seeds here are the story of intergenerational resilience coming to alive to dance into another day. And there's a spirit fire that dances inside of each one of these kernels of corn that we are planting in our gardens season after season. A tiny spark of life that holds breath and prayer of those who came before us. Those ancestors prayed that we, generations later, would have good food to eat and clean water to drink and good mind and good health and vibrant health for all our relations, not just our human relatives. These prayers kindle our own spirit fire to be the continuation of their prayers, to make embodied prayers on behalf of our children. And that's what I see here today in this audience in, in the face of each and every one of you, is that you make your life a love poem and an honoring song for all those people who endured whatever they endured, sometimes unspeakable acts and challenges, so that you could be alive today to be the continuation of those prayers, that you would put that love and that passion and that prayer into the food that you bring to the market, in the seeds that you carry in your lives, in the way that you, you move along your path. Because it's not an easy path, I know it. But it's these prayers, this embodied prayer, that gets us out in when it's 100 degrees in July, when the weeds are this tall, or it gets us up early in the morning to carry our baskets of produce to the market, right? It's those prayers that we might have something to offer our children. And so in honor of the grand lineage of esteemed and honorable and beautiful ancestors that left for us a beautiful legacy of seeds, I want us all, as we leave here tonight, to make renewed commitment to be those people, that generation, who didn't forget who we were and where we came from and all of the seeds that have been passed down from hand to hand to hand, that we weren't the generation that forgot, that we remembered that we all stand on the doorway of memory, right? That it is our responsibility, it is our obligation to honor our ancestors in that way, to ensure that there's good food to eat for our children. Thank you very much. It's hot in here, though. I've never given a keynote in a room that felt so stuffy, you know, <laughs> in a gym nonetheless. But thank you all for all your good spirit. I don't know 
if we're doing Q and A or if we're wrapping it up. I know it's late, but would you like to say something? Yeah, if anybody has a question or something that they feel inspired to say. I think there'd be some great collaborations that can be made. Um, I think it first starts with acknowledging that there still are native people who live in the Northeast and not a lot of people recognize that, you know? It's a complicated lineage, you know, that we were on the front lines and so oftentimes we're hidden. Oftentimes we're, you know, trying to do the work as best we can. Um, I know that a number of our elders have made it to the NOFA New York conference and have been offered, you know, esteemed places to speak on, on, on this work as well as I have. So I think continuing to make space uh, within these gatherings for a multitude of different voices, not only native, but, you know, in many different walks of life, many different people of color, and, and doing the work uh, as, as many organizations are doing now to do the diversity training, to recognize how we can have uh, strong and powerful uh, native and, and people of color as a part of the decision-making process. So, you know, however we can facilitate that in the work uh, that, you know, in the noble endeavors that you guys are already doing, I think it's, it's time to, to invite all the stakeholders to the table, which includes the original, uh, you know, landholders of this, of this land here. So, okay. thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Very much a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, oh, one more question. One more question. Go for it. Well, that's a great question. I think the question that she asked was, how do we envision these seeds moving in the world? You know, whether they move through the markets or whether they stay within indigenous communities. Um, we have interesting allies in this work. I think that many of our, within our, the cultural values that we hold within our native communities is that we see these seeds as our relatives, so we don't see them as commodities necessarily, so um, having them move into the market isn't necessarily what we want, but at the same time, we recognize that um, getting them out as, as uh, accessible food products, value-added food products, is a good first step. The seeds move just like people do. The seeds migrate. And it's our hope as Native peoples to continue to allow the seeds to move uh, in and out of different communities as best we can, as long as we know that we can, uh, that they're continued to be held as, as sacred and that they're continued to be held in integrity and not patented or, you know, there's not a threat to our capacity as Native peoples to continue to steward them. Um, the ironies in all of this is that um, you know, many of these seeds that were lost in our communities were held in the hands of settler descendant farmers um, during the times of acculturation, displacement, and, and all of these things. And so, in fact, it's actually a really beautiful thing to have the seeds moving, you know, cross-culturally and in and out of indigenous communities. But what we're hoping is to create these respectful and um, beautiful alliances that are rooted in the reconciliation and reparations work that has to happen in order that we might imbue some of our understanding of how best to care for these seeds and to influence uh, the organic seed movement as a whole. So, yeah. Great, wonderful. And I think what he says is so important because when we talk about Food justice, we also need to be talking about seed justice. And we talk about social justice, we need to be talking about access to healthy food ways, right? And we need to be thinking as an organic community of what it means to honor the lineages from which these seeds descend, you know, from which, you know, these seeds descend from. Thinking about the ways in which these seeds move and, and, and honoring that and honoring the voices of those people who carried these seeds for so long. So we, uh, we stand together in solidarity. I appreciate that. Yeah. One, one more comment in, in the way back, and then we're going to let Rowan be. You can hang out with <laughs> Rowan afterwards. I'm probably not going to share a song in this space just because it's, it's kind of inappropriate, mostly because we're in a gym. You know, if we were in the field, uh, it would be appropriate. But I do want to say that um, one of the mo most profound parts of, of reconnecting um, my own life back into our ancestral seeds and culture and traditions is being a carrier of the sacred seed songs. And one of my uh, dear and beloved friends who's an Anishinaabe midwife from the upper Midwest, uh, she shared with me a song uh, which 
was profound to me because all of the Anishinaabe seed songs, they come from birthing songs. And so as seed keepers, we're actually plant midwives, right? We're helping to steward life from one generation to the next in the form of, of, uh, of plants. So I love that. It's not only am I a seed keeper, but I'm a plant midwife. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Uh, and in the words of that song, I won't sing it, but she says, um, a, 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 a midwife would say to a woman in labor, she would say, Maji ishka, and that means come in your own time, right? Come when you're ready. And so as seed keepers, we sing this song to our seeds and our plants, and we say, come in your own time, sacred seed. We humbly implore you, we ask you, we, we beg of you, we court of you, that you might grant us good life, that you might be in our life. And when we sing those songs to the seeds and to the plants, we recenter our relationship to them, you know? And we remind ourselves and our children and our, all of the grand family of relations that are around us that it's not about when, we get it when we want it, we control it, we, you know, exploit, we, you know, we do all of these things, but that these seeds and these foods are a gift, right? And they come when they're ready. And they come to us, you know, as a means to support our life upon this planet and as humble humans you know we ask so much of the world around us and so you know those songs that we carry they remind us of those agreements and they're beautiful and um, you know I see tears coming from your eyes and that connection it's okay because you know this work it also brings up for us you know when I was here at Hampshire College and I was learning about the ancestral seeds of my people with that came a, a huge wellspring of grief um, of recognizing that this wasn't something that I was born into and that I had to reclaim it and I see a lot of you nodding your heads because many almost all of us Every one of us in this room is, is not untouched by the grief of disconnection and not understanding who we are and where we come from. And, but we all descend from people who had seed songs. We all descend from people who had those connections. So maybe this is an invitation for you to also dig back in your own lineage and find that connection to those um, you know, powerful songs that all of our ancestors carried and sang to the plants. So hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Rowan. Uh, thank you for remaining. And please come talk to Rowan if, if you'd like to converse with her more. We're going to have um, Contra Dance now. Um, come and enjoy. Um, good night. Thank you. <laughs>